Pues buenas tardes a todos, eh, bienvenidos a esta primera sesión del 2019 del Seminario Universitario de, de Geopatrimonio y Geoparques. Este es un horario inusual, eh, como saben algunos de ustedes y si alguno no lo sabe, eh, solemos eh, reunirnos los últimos días jueves de cada mes para tener alguna presentación y estas, eh, en esta ocasión eh, pues no estamos en el horario, ni en el día ni en la hora que acostumbramos y la próxima sesión tampoco va a estar en día y hora, pero la, la cuestión es de que hemos tenido ya bastantes solicitudes de presentaciones y seguramente vamos a tener que adecuarnos o hacer una nueva propuesta de los días que vamos a tener que estas sesiones. Así que, bueno, les, les informaremos. Eh, eh, muchos de ustedes reciben las notificaciones por, por correo, eh, se notifica también en Facebook. Eh, y, y el día de hoy, pues, le eh, aprovechamos también la ocasión de tener aquí a, a Tomás Casadeval. Eh, eh, Tomás Casadeval nos va a dar, eh, estuvo hace unos momentos, algunos de ustedes también, en una presentación que hizo en el Instituto de Geofísica. Y bueno, ahora viene esta, esta presentación que viene mucho al tema de, de lo que manejamos, eh, que es el interés del Seminario Universitario de Geoparques. Y agradecemos que tenga dos pláticas seguidas, eh, eh, pero es de mucho interés también para el seminario. Y eh, bueno, en coordinación con Carles, pues vamos a, le, le vamos a pedir a Carles que lo presente a nuestro ponente el día de hoy, entre otras razones porque es su paisano, ¿no? El Casadeval es catalán, ¿no? Entonces, bueno, Carles. muchas gracias José Luis, también Mariana. Eh, gracias especialmente porque para mí es muy, bueno, es un evento importante poder presentar a, a un colega, un geólogo, digamos, de la talla de Thomas Casadevall, porque me han dicho que lo pronuncie en catalán, así que va a ser así, y con el que ya hemos tenido, pues, este, desde hace algunos años, contacto, eh, eh, se, se, desde, desde mi grupo hemos conocido el trabajo, un trabajo casi, este, eh, como se diría, numantino, es decir, de una resistencia para, para que realmente el tema del patrimonio geológico sea, se abra un espacio también eh, en Estados Unidos y el tema de los geoparques, que tiene unas peculiaridades y que él ha encabezado. Pero bueno, aparte de eso, pues es un, un, una persona, un colega con una enorme trayectoria. Él es, eh, tiene, digamos, el nombramiento de científico emérito de desde 2008 y se ha trabajado en, en el tema de la vulcanología, ¿no? el vulcanismo activo, riesgos relacionados con eh, habitantes, con aviación, y actualmente bueno, el tema en el que estamos activos es el patrimonio geológico y paisajes volcánicos protegidos. Eh, es el líder eh, del grupo asesor de geopatrimonio y geoparques, bueno, tiene un nombre ligeramente diferente en inglés, de Estados Unidos. Eh, además de que eh, re revisa, por ejemplo, los estudios de la Unión Internacional de la Conservación de la Naturaleza sobre volcanes. ¿sí? Es miembro de la Comisión Mundial de Áreas Protegidas dentro de, esa, de la Unión Internacional a la que me he referido, donde eh, pues cada vez está siendo un lugar importante, gracias a personas como él, el tema del geopatrimonio. Eh, desde 1996 hasta 2008 fue, eh, trabajó en la dentro de la dirección del USGS, del Servicio Geológico de Estados Unidos, que muchos de nosotros pues, lo tenemos presente como una, un, un organismo eh, de referencia para muchas, muchas cuestiones, eh, y, y ahí fungió como director regional para la región occidental, director interino en, en el 98, director adjunto, eh, bueno, y así varios este, puestos de, estratégicos. Eh, también trabajó como geólogo en el programa de riesgos volcánicos de la, del mismo USGS, en el Observatorio de Volcanes de Hawái, en, eh, en, en los volcanes de, de la cordillera de Cascadia, en Alaska, en Colorado. Eh, básicamente en este tema también asesoró al Servicio Volcanológico de Indonesia, en, concretamente que tiene su sede en la isla de Java. 
en Ecuador, eh, ha asesorado en exploración minera también eh, y eh, para varias compañías. Y en, entonces, bueno, de seguro su visión es súper amplia y nos puede apoyar muchísimo, así que le voy a pedir que, que ya nos dé esta plática. Gracias, Carlos, y gracias, José Luis. Y buenas tardes a todos. Este, bueno, yo, yo puedo presentar la cosa en castellano, pero prefiero presentarlo en inglés y voy a hablar despacito, Uh, porque tenemos muchas diapositivas y quiero que ustedes me entiendan bien. Ahora, si podemos... Ah, perfecto, perfecto. Este, primero, first, a little bit about my background. Um, um, I was born in the United States, <clears throat> but when I was a young child, my family moved to Argentina, to Buenos Aires, and so I speak Spanish sometimes with an Argentine accent although some of the ladies don't think it's Argentine anymore. Um, my career as a geologist uh, began in the mining area. I worked for a small gold mining company in the state of Colorado after I received my geology degree. <clears throat> And then I did my graduate thesis on gold mineralization in volcanic rocks. This led me to be interested in volcanoes, and so I began to study active volcanoes in Latin America and in Hawaii. And in 1980, in the United States, Mount St. Helens volcano erupted, and I was very fortunate to be part of the Mount St. Helens team that studied volcanism there. Um, My career went on and I became interested in volcanoes that erupt explosively, uh, that, that damage aircraft, to, so volcanic hazards to aviation safety. And, uh, <clears throat> and then I became involved in administration. In 2008, I retired from United States Geological Survey and I became interested in geologic heritage, particularly from the education and outreach opportunities that geologic heritage presented. Um, a few years ago, I was asked by UNESCO to evaluate some um, sites for world heritage classification. These are volcanic sites, and that led me very strongly into the whole area of geologic heritage in protected volcanic areas. So the talk that I gave earlier this morning was about protected volcanic landscapes at the international level. Um, at the same time, I've been very interested in geologic heritage in the United States, not just in volcanic areas, but in all areas. And so my talk today is going to be about geologic heritage in the United States and how we present it, how we promote it. And so this will be a review of geologic heritage in the United States, number one. And number two, it will tell you why I think geologic heritage is very important and why I'm devoting a lot of my time to it now. And, uh, and so finally, I want to thank the UNAM, particularly Hugo Delgado, um, my friends here, Jose Luis Palacios, Uh, Carlos Canet, the uh, friends that I have here for inviting me to give these talks. It's a great honor to be back in Mexico. I said earlier my first visit to Mexico was in August of 1966. I was 18 years old and I wanted to see uh, the world. And Mexico was high on my list because I could speak some Spanish and I was interested in the cultures of Mexico. My first study was in the area of social anthropology, and then I added geology to that. So my academic background is social anthropology, geology. And um, over the years, I've made many more trips to Mexico, but this is my first trip to Mexico City in more than 20 years. I'm, I'm sorry to say, it's been a long time. So um, let's go on and have a look at how we uh, geologic heritage in the United States. 
First of all, some simple definitions of what we mean by geologic heritage. It's pretty simply the connection between people, landscapes, including aesthetic landscapes, uh, and earth history that forms the foundation of geologic heritage, or as we call it, geoheritage. And it embodies geologic features with significant scientific, cultural, educational, or historical value. And thirdly, this geoheritage around the world is being used increasingly to link and uh, to, to celebrate this linkage between our landscapes and our cultures. But that's the that's a technical definition. Geologic heritage is also very personal. And so in this case, I'm going to talk about why it's personal for me. This, of course, is Mount St. Helens volcano in Washington State that had a major eruption. This, to me, is will always be the best example of a volcano that I know because it's the one I worked on most closely. When I worked in the gold mine in Colorado, do you know what mineral this is? Anyone? Rhodochrosite. Rhodochrosite. And the mine I worked in has, at least for United States, some of the best examples of rhodochrosite. So when I was working, looking for gold, I was also looking for rhodochrosite. <clears throat> this rock here, for the geologist in the room, we would call a porphyry. It's a porphyritic rock, which simply means you have large crystals that sit in a very fine-grained matrix. So you have two very distinct igneous events that are captured by this rock. And when I go to give talks to school children or to uh, people who are not geologists, I always talk about porphyry rocks because they can understand that these large crystals formed deep in the earth when magma was cooling slowly. And then because of a volcanic event, that material was brought to the surface and the rest of the material, the matrix of the material, chilled and formed this very characteristic rock. And um, it's, I think porphyritic rocks are the most beautiful rocks. So the most beautiful volcano, the most beautiful mineral, the most beautiful rock. And then this is the area where I worked in Colorado. This is called the San Juan Mountains, Montañas de San Juan. And this is in southwest Colorado. And every layer that you see here is a volcanic layer from a caldera forming eruption. It's what we call a pyroclastic flow or an ash flow tuff. And in my career, I have gone up and down all these mountains. And so for me, these are features that I want to make sure are conserved for the future. I want to make sure that my children or my grandchildren or my friends or you when you come to visit the United States, if you go to St. Helens, if you go to San Juan in Colorado and you see these rocks, I'm, I want to share these important features with you. So I always say geologic heritage is personal and I'm quite sure that I could ask every person in this room where is your favorite geology? Where is your favorite volcano? Where is your favorite rock? What's your favorite part of geoheritage? These are things that are important to you that you want to make sure have some level of conservation for the future. So the other question that I'm asked all the time is, why are you studying geologic heritage? And I say because I can see geologic heritage as having some very clear benefits to society. And these are the four that I usually like to talk about. First of all, there's economic benefits from protecting a landscape, having it as a park or a reserve or as a geopark. And those economic benefits include jobs, 
They include support for visitors who come to enjoy that area. They include the, the sustainable development of that area. A second important benefit is that if we preserve or conserve a geologic landscape, we also become involved in the study of that landscape and so improved science literacy. A better understanding of that geology is very important. Third is very, very important, at least in the United States. I, don't, the, I think people in Mexico are more healthy. As I've been walking around the last few days, you see lots of people outside. And, and not everybody's on their cell phone. People are looking around. They're enjoying their environment. In the United States, it's, it, many people stay inside. But when you go to visit a geologic area, a geopark or a national park, you have to get out. You have to move around. So improved health and well-being. And then the fourth one is a better understanding of how the earth works and concepts about the earth. So these are, these are the answers I give when people say, why are you wasting, no, I don't say that, why, why are you doing geologic heritage? It's because I see clear benefits. For example, every year the U.S. Geological Survey has to prepare a report for Congress saying how much economic benefit the national parks present to the people of the United States. So in 2016, the national parks, because of visitors' visitation, provided $35 billion to the economy of these areas. Very, very important. We call it an economic engine. And, uh, and so this, is, this, is, this points out how economically important they are. There's another aspect. When people think of the United States, they think of a very rich country. And it is a rich country. But it's also a very large country. We have 3,600 counties. In Espanol, yo creo que county is una comarca. Comarca? Uh, ¿Cómo? Municipio. 3,600 counties or municipios. And this is a report by the National Association of Counties. And it po points out that 80% of the counties in the United States are below the poverty line. Again, we have a lot of wealth in the United States, but it's very concentrated in the cities like New York or Houston or Los Angeles or San Francisco or Denver. So we have a lot of poverty in our rural counties. And it's also these rural counties which have some of the most spectacular scenery, some of the most spectacular geological sites. It's also the counties where we had a lot of our mining, logging, uh, ranching. Um, but these counties, this, these are the counties that I would work in when I was doing geology. And I knew that rural counties in the United States suffered because they did not have a strong economic base. And in the small town where I did my mining geology, it was very important, it is very important for me to try to help them improve that economy. This is another important point, improved health and well-being. Now, this scene on the right, this is an ash flow tuff from the Valle, Valle Grande Caldera in New Mexico. And I went to visit it because it's also a national park. And I was walking along, and I was just taking pictures to give for use in my talks. And I noticed this young boy, he had a red shirt. And I said, oh, that's great. You know, it's, I'm going to get these kids. Here they are, some nice American kids climbing up a ladder to go into this, uh, this little house. And um, so I, I walk up, and their parents are standing there. And I said, do you mind if I take a picture of your children? And they looked at me, and they said, oh, well, we don't speak English, so we're good. And I said, I, I said, where are you from? He said, we're from Madrid. 
And so, uh, yo hablé con los padres de los chicos para pedir si yo podía sacar una foto de tres niños de España disfrutando en Bandelier National Monument en los Estados Unidos. <laughs> Porque en este tiempo no había chicos americanos o de Estados Unidos. So, improved health and well-being. This is what I think a lot of children could do at geoparks or, or at parks around the world. It means that you get out, you enjoy the atmosphere, you enjoy the environment. So a little bit about the history of geoheritage in the United States. Historically, geoheritage has been linked to the national park system and other federal land management agencies. The focus of those national parks has been the preservation of geological features. This was the main reason for establishing many parks. It wasn't because of the birds, it wasn't because of the vegetation, it was because of the geologic features. And so the conservation of our geologic heritage through parks, monuments, and other designations has been the the main object of geoheritage in the United States. The first protected landscape in the United States was in California, in Yosemite Valley, very close to San Francisco. And during the Civil War in 1864, President Lincoln established the Yosemite Grant to set aside the Yosemite Valley for preservation and public use. But this was for the state of California. He gave the land to California for preservation and protection. The first national park in the United States was Yellowstone National Park in the state of Wyoming. This was established by Congress in 1872 as the nation and also the world's first national park. This was managed for many years by the U.S. Army, the Ejército Militar, in the United States. In the early 20th century, in 1906, we had the Antiquities Act, whereby the president, by executive decision, could set aside a monument. And so this is the example of Devil's Tower. It was the first national monument established in 1906. And now in the United States we have a lot of protected lands. The different colors, these are Indian lands. The green colors are forest service lands. These dark green colors are national parks or national monuments. And you can see the majority of these are in the western United States also in Alaska. In the eastern United States, we don't have as many parks or protected landscapes. These are the symbols of the various federal level public lands agencies, and of course the National Park Service, the Bureau of Land Management, the Fish and Wildlife Service, and the U.S. Forest Service. These are the four main federal agencies that manage the public lands. So the major one is the National Park Service. The National Park Service has 418 park units. Here's the Grand Canyon. Here's Yosemite. Here's Yellowstone. Here's Rocky Mountain National Park near Denver, Colorado which is my home here. So you can see we have quite a array and distribution of national parks. 418 of them and they are highly variable. Let's look at a couple geological parks. First of all, if you go on the National Park Service website, you'll see that there's a lot of information about geologic heritage. It's a tremendously rich resource for geoheritage. But we've also set up what we call the unofficial, non-official, 
el sitio no oficial o registro no oficial de sitios de patrimonio geológico, unofficial national register of geoheritage sites. And you can search by state. It's, it's a very good resource. Another resource is that we also have National Fossil Day in the United States. It's typically the second Wednesday or the third Wednesday in October. And we have a very rich website about National Fossil Day. And then we also have a program of national landmarks. These can be particular outcrops or geosites. And again, we have a very good index of those. These are all managed or overseen by the National Park Service. But in addition to parks and monuments, the National Park Service has many other designations. Historical parks, monuments, national parks, battlefields, preserves, recreation areas, seashores, parkways, lakeshores, reserves, geologic trails, and national heritage areas. The U.S. Forest Service has two national monuments. They both happen to be volcanic. One is Mount St. Helens National Monument in the state of Washington, and the other is Newberry Crater National Volcanic Monument in the state of Oregon. But the U.S. Forest Service also manages all the national forests, as well as a large number of wilderness areas where there is no development. The Bureau of Land Management has several monuments, and this is one in New Mexico called Tent Rocks, and it's ash flow tuff from the, Valle, uh, from the uh, Valle Grande Caldera. And this is a particularly interesting one because this monument is managed as a partnership between the Bureau of Land Management and the indigenous population, the people of Cochiti Pueblo in northern New Mexico. So geologic heritage in the United States, many of our parks and monuments are in pristine areas. These are not developed areas. There's very little towns. People don't live in the parks and monuments in the United States. So for the most part, when you think about National Park Service in the United States, really you're thinking about wilderness areas. And so for more than 100 years, Geologic heritage in the United States has meant geology in wilderness areas or very, very undeveloped areas. No mining, no logging, no people living there, no development of the resources. And in, in a way, this is why the United States has been a little bit slow to be involved in the modern geoheritage movement. We have no global geoparks. We have no geoparks in the United States because many of our people say, well, we have our national parks and national monuments. And that's true, but those national parks and national monuments serve a very different need or a very different use than a global geopark. Remember back to these municipalidades, municipios, that have a lot of poverty. They have spectacular scenery but they don't have national parks in them. And so they can't benefit. So in the United States, first of all, in much of the world, the premier designation for protecting world-class geologic landscapes are the UNESCO World Heritage and Global Geoparks Program. Mexico has about 23 World Heritage Sites. You've got some spectacular ones like the Pinacate, Desierto Pinacate up in the north. Um, you've got a lot of wonderful World Heritage Sites. You've got many cultural sites. We're sitting in a, a World Heritage Site right now. The UNAM campus is a World Heritage Site. Pirámides de Teotihuacán is a World Heritage Site. But these are cultural sites. Okay? And the other designation, Global Geoparks, we have no geoparks in the United States. You have two now here in Mexico. 
recently designated the uh, Mixteca Alta near Oaxaca and the uh, Comarca Minera in, the, in Hidalgo. Uh, globally, there are more than 200 World Heritage Natural Sites with great geology and more than 140 global geoparks. But in the United States, we have 23 World Heritage Sites very close to Mexico and nine sites are inscribed primarily for geoheritage. Um, this is a very typical plaque that you get from UNESCO. This is for Hawaii Volcanoes National Park. But we'll do a quick review of just a few of the U.S. World Heritage Sites for geology. Uh, Great Smoky Mountains National Park in eastern United States it has about 16 million visitors per year. It's very close to the population centers in the east. And so this is a World Heritage Site and also a national park. Carlsbad Caverns, a spectacular um, cavern system in the state of New Mexico is also World Heritage. Grand Canyon National Park, we mentioned that at the very beginning. It's a very important World Heritage Site. The Wrangell St. Elias Glacier Bay uh, World Heritage Site. So those are just some examples of a few of the U.S. World Heritage Sites. So recognizing that we have many communities in the United States that could benefit from a global geopark, the National Academy of Sciences um, five years ago, four years ago, formed the U.S. Geoheritage and Geoparks Advisory Group. And this is our little symbol, and uh, we have a small membership, and I, I am uh, the chairman for this group. Established in February of 2016, it's a program development activity of the National Committee to the IUGS, the International Union of Geological Sciences, and we operate with oversight from the U.S. National Academy of Sciences. This is our website. It's, uh, it's a website, what can I say? You can go and visit it and you can get additional resource information. The goals of the advisory group are to work with states and interested communities to promote and develop geoheritage projects and products. It's also to communicate and educate American communities about the Global Geopark Program and how they can participate. Also advise the National Academies and the National Committee for IUGS on matters related to geologic hazards or heritage and represent U.S. interest on the global geoheritage stage. So my visit here to Mexico this week, this is fulfilling part of that requirement, that goal. So what is a global geopark? Um, here in Mexico, you already have two, so I feel a little uh, awkward explaining to people what a global geopark is because you guys have obviously gotten the ball rolling already. But they're single unified geographic areas where sites and landscapes of international geologic significance are managed with the concept of protecting, educating, research, and sustainable development. This is a map a little bit out of date showing um, the uh, global geoparks. You notice that the two from Mexico aren't on here. Also, there's a third one now in Canada. So there are about 140 global geoparks. And it's important when I give this talk in the United States to explain to people that global geoparks don't carry any formal legislative designation. Americans are very concerned that someone will try to come in and take their property. And so when they see a designation like a global geopark, they think, I'm going to lose control of my property, and that, of course, is not correct, okay? Because the host nation or private landowners retain complete control over their land. Each geopark is protected by existing policies and managed to retain its global geopark status. And currently, the global geopark designation is not available to U.S. communities. 
because three weeks ago, um, the president, President Trump, withdrew the United States from participation in UNESCO. It's a very bad decision, but it's been made. At least for the time being, the United States is not a member of UNESCO. However, if you're a U.S. community and are interested in developing geoparks, we do have several designations, and I'll talk about those. We have a scenic byways program and a national heritage area program. So the challenge in the United States is we already have many parks. We already have many levels of protected landscapes. So the question I'm asked is, why make more? Why do you need more? And we try to explain that really geoparks are different. And rather than simply preserving heritage, they're more about an immersive experience for enjoying and experiencing for example, how mining districts were discovered, grew, worked, and declined. And as I told you, at the start of my career, I worked in a very active mining district. In 1980, that mining district, all the mines closed down. Those miners had no employment. And that community has really been a very impoverished or very poor community for, go for more than 30 years now. So I see geoparks as an opportunity to celebrate that mining heritage, to evaluate the, the beauty of the San Juan Mountains, and to bring economic benefit to the town. But they also involve, geoparks uh, offer the opportunity to directly involve communities to be involved in the development, interpretation, management, and geologic story of their landscape. It, it brings people together around a common theme, and that's very important. And also in the United States, we have many other options for protecting our geologic landscapes. Let me talk about four communities in the United States that have been working with us to develop geoparks. The first is the Gold Belt Scenic Byway, uh, which includes Florissant fossil beds, but also includes the Cripple Creek mining district, very famous gold mining district. A second is the Denver Basin, which has great dinosaur fossils, has great structural geology, and spectacular, beautiful scenery. The third is the state of Michigan in the central part of the United States, where uh, the Keweenaw Peninsula, a volcanic geology area that has a national park two national parks, but is also the source of some of the first copper mining in North America. And just like the Comarca Minera, the Cornish miners have a very strong heritage there. Um, and the fourth one is the Appalachian Geopark in West Virginia, very close to Washington, D.C. There are three National Park Service units that form that. This is a guidebook. You can go online and download the guidebook. It's free, but it talks about the Gold Belt Scenic Byway. This is just west of Colorado Springs and just west of Pikes Peak, for those of you who might be familiar with Colorado. Fossils are very important. Gold mining is very important. The Denver Basin, this is a view from the Red Rocks Amphitheater area. Um, this is the this is the place where the Rocky Mountains meet the plains. And there's a major Rocky Mountain fault that runs north-south through this area. It's a major structural feature of the continent of North America when you see it from a satellite. It's also an area of high uh, population. The city of Denver, the city of Boulder, are there, but also an area with some spectacular geology. This ridge is made up of the Morrison sandstone. The Morrison sandstone was one of the first and most important locations for dinosaur fossils in the 19th century. And this is called Dinosaur Ridge. My house is right over here. This is the Kiwinaw 
area. It's the northernmost point of the state of Michigan. Canada is on the other side, just at the top of the photo. It includes Michigan's Upper Peninsula, two counties, very small population, no active mining today. And again, it was the mining heritage that brought people there. Even the indigenous peoples, even the, the first Americans, they came here to mine the native copper to make artifacts or to make tools. Okay? And this includes two national parks. This is the state of West Virginia. This is the area of the West Virginia or the Appalachian Geopark Project. <clears throat> this is very important geologically for the coal mining. This was the heart of the coal mining tradition in the eastern United States. And over the last 30 years, many of these coal mines now have closed down because it's not economic to mine the coal in the old-fashioned way. And so in the state of West Virginia, they've got spectacular scenery like New River Gorge, which is in the coal country. And so we're working with these three counties or municipios to help develop an Appalachian Geopark project. And there's a lot of strong uh, public interest in, in, uh, in, the, in this project. So we also have alternate designations where we can highlight geologic heritage, national heritage areas, and scenic byways. A national heritage area is a place where culture, nature, and historic resources come together to form a cohesive, nationally important landscape. These national heritage areas are grassroots, community-driven, approach to heritage conservation and sustainable economic development. When you think about global geoparks, these very much fit some of the criteria or the reasons for global geoparks. We have 49 national heritage areas uh, across the United States, including several here in uh, Colorado. And uh, another designation we have is called the Scenic Byway. And a scenic byway is a, ro a route, a road, that connects the traveler to unique natural, scenic, historical, recreational, and archaeological heritage of an area. And we have about 60 scenic byways in the United States, including quite a few here in my state of Colorado. And natural quality in scenic byways these include geological formations, fossils, and landforms. So it has a very strong geoheritage component. So going back, the advisory group in 2019, what we're doing now, we are having these consultations with US communities. Even though they can't be global geoparks, we're looking into the idea of a domestic geopark program. For example, in Canada, they have three geoparks, but uh, UNESCO geoparks, but they have almost a dozen uh, national geoparks, or they aspire to be UNESCO geoparks. We're also working very closely with the Association of American State Geologists. Um, here in Mexico, I think you have 32 states, and I think a number of them have their own state geological surveys. We view them as very important partners for a national geoheritage program. We're going to have a workshop. I mentioned earlier that at the Geologic Society of America meeting in Phoenix, Arizona in September, we're going to have a short course on geoheritage led by Professor Jose Brila from Portugal. And we'll also have a Pardi session at GSA um, inviting some distinguished uh, geoheritage specialists, particularly from North America, to discuss geoheritage. And also seeking closer cooperation with the Canadian Commission on Geoparks. I'm, I'm an observer member of the Canadian Commission on Global Geoparks. And also with the Mexican Geoparks Group to unify geoheritage efforts in North America. 
So quickly, in North America, Canada has three UNESCO Global Geoparks. Mexico has two. With a number of aspiring geoparks, the United States has none yet. In Canada, they've actively promoted geoparks since 2004. We have the Canadian Commis Committee. Um, the first UNESCO Global Geopark in North America was at Stonehammer. The second was at Tumbler Ridge, and now Per Se is the third. And Tumbler Ridge is here in British Columbia, and Stonehammer and Per Se are in eastern Canada. In Mexico, you have two, as you know. Um, the Comarca Minera, especially celebrating mining heritage. And this is really what I'm, as, as I told you, one of the reasons for my visit, I'm very anxious to see how we handle, how they handle the mining heritage discussion in this geopark. And then Mixteca Alta out of Oaxaca. And you've seen these spectacular pictures. I'm looking forward to at least the Comarca Minera during this visit. And Mexico and global geopark and the global volcanic estate. This was part of my earlier talk. There are other features here in Mexico, particularly, again, I was interested in just the volcanic aspects, but El Chichon, Tres Virgenes in Baja California, and Paracutin. These are features that are well known globally. Um, they're iconic, they're, they're very unique for the global volcanic estate. And uh, this was just to be to give some ideas in my previous talk. Also, the monasteries of Popocatapetl, one reason I wanted to visit this time was to sort of see how these monasteries and the world, this, these are a world heritage site, how they relate to um, the, the, the Popocatapetl um, uh, discussion. And I'm, Ana Lilian is here, and I'm gonna try to follow up with some more discussion with, with her on this. So going back to the states, um, we think it's very important that, that the states uh, become involved in geologic heritage. A number of the states have good geoheritage sites, but they don't use a common vocabulary. Some of them don't even talk about geoheritage. They see them as geoeducational or geological outreach opportunities. Uh, they have no inventory of the sites or landmarks of geosites in their states. They could do a lot more to work with communities to organize geoheritage to increase visitation, and especially link to other state agencies on tourism, education, parks, to promote the benefits of a state's geologic heritage. And again, um, they could develop some methods and protocols, and this is why we're bringing Jose Brilla in for the meeting in Phoenix in September, in particular to get him to give an explanation. It's, a lot of times it's easier for someone from outside your country to come in and make a statement and have people believe you than it is if I simply explain it myself. So um, we're, we're going to be developing some best practices for the state geological surveys so that we can increase economic development, work with tourism agencies, educational groups, et cetera. These are some of the websites. These are some examples. This is the website from the state of Arkansas in southeastern United States. You can see that they organize it by geology, energy resources, hazards, mineral resources, water, education, etc. This is from my state of Colorado. It's looking very different than Arkansas, but the same categories of hazards and resources. This is from the state of North Carolina, where there's a big emphasis on using resources for outreach and education. This is the state of Utah, and um, uh, this, this is a very clever uh, presentation, for example, building stones of downtown Salt Lake City. And I was visiting with some colleagues in Mexico City uh, on Sunday, and I said, wouldn't it be great if there was a guide to the building stones of downtown Mexico City, because you have some incredible volcanic building stones, ashlow tufts, lavas, uh, porphyritic rocks. You also have igneous rocks like granites and gabbros. 
you have quite a selection. And this would be a great project for some undergraduate person interested in the building stones of Mexico City. Maybe it already exists, but I didn't know where to find it. This is for the state of Texas. Texas has a very modest program to uh, put up what they call their geosign program, explaining to people what the geology, uh, geologic features of Texas are. And then this is New Mexico. New Mexico has a wonderful virtual geologic tour of the state. The reason for showing you these six examples is just to show you we have great diversity in how the different states look at geoheritage. There's no unity, there's no common vocabulary. And so part of the role of the advisory group to promote geoheritage in the United States is to work more closely with the state agencies. This is Pennsylvania, where I went to graduate school here at Penn State. And this is a map showing the 30 most significant geologic features in the state of Pennsylvania. And here's Wyoming, just north of uh, Colorado. Again, showing very important geologic sites or geosites in the state of Wyoming. And then our state of Utah uses, we have five major national parks in the state of Utah. And these five are called the Mighty Five and they underpin the tourist promotion program to increase visitation by tourists to the state of Utah. So that's an example of what we're doing to promote geoheritage in the United States. Um, it just gives you a flavor of what we're doing. And during my visit here to Mexico this week and next week, I look forward to seeing how you're promoting geoheritage in Mexico. Thank you very much. Or in English. <laughs> or in English, sure. Well, thank you for your uh, excellent talk. And um, I just wondered one thing. You talked about your experience as in mining, and then you also talked about the, uh, the recovery of abandoned mining zones. But I wonder if you can talk about a little bit about the aspect of pollution of mining and the current conflicts of mining. I mean, uh, mining... Uh, has a destructive, eff destructive effect on landscapes and it's, uh, there are many tense and conflict situations with the preservation of geological heritage, especially under this current political administration of President Trump. So maybe, sorry, but uh, also it's not a, also a beautiful story. There are also, also many conflicts. Um, does I think everyone understands the question. Eh, estamos hablando del impacto de la minería en el medio ambiente y cómo podemos avanzar con este tema. Well, first of all, the um, the environmental effects of mining are being addressed by a wide range of state and federal level laws, environmental laws that require uh, the cleanup of sites, that require the management and um, uh, closure of these sites. What we're trying to do with the geologic heritage effort is to highlight for the people that first of all it was mining and mining geology that not only attracted people to those areas for the economic development, but also for the scientific development. So the basis of the earth sciences in the United States really relates back in very strongly to its mining heritage. As you've said very well, particularly in the 19th and early 20th century, and even to today, to be honest, those mining activities have a negative impact on the environment. And for the most part, the citizens in the United States don't understand that. 
They know that there's a mine. They know that there's lawsuits or there are challenges to use of those mines. And, but they don't fully understand that connection. And what we see is through the geoheritage, the ability to explain why the mines are there, what benefits the mines have had over the years, and now what the, what the problems are related to those mines that have to be addressed. And so it's not that geoheritage is in a position to solve those environmental problems, but I see geoheritage as an opportunity to more fully inform the citizen why the mines are there, what the benefits have been, and what the lasting impacts of those mines will be. And I'm sure here in Mexico it's a very similar history. It was the mining that originally attracted a lot of the early investment and exploration that resulted in our basic geologic understanding here in Mexico. And it gave great economic benefit to Mexico just as it did in the United States. But now we have to live with the, with the results of some of that. And I think there are efforts underway to change that, to change, um, certainly in the United States, to change the mining practices. Um, but I, so I guess that's how I would see geoheritage contributing to help. And that's one reason I want to see, for example, in the Comarca Minera. I, I have friends who work in the Guanajuato area and, and, and other mining areas here in Mexico. And um, I know you have, we have the same challenges. So, but seeing how they present it. So the, the purists in the United States tell me you shouldn't include any mining areas at all in your geoheritage studies. No, don't include them because the land has already been used. It's already been exploited. It's already been developed. It's already been dañado. It's already been damaged. And I say, no, that's exactly the reason we have to include it because people have to understand what that heritage is. I know it's not a great answer, but it's... <laughs> yeah, Hugo. Sí, gracias por la excelente charla, Tom. Eh, tengo dos comentarios. <coughs> Uno es que eh, precisamente el concepto de geoparque eh, permite introducir un concepto que es muy importante y que está en boga hoy en, hoy en día en las ciencias de la Tierra, que es la geoética porque la geoética tiene que ver precisamente, no solamente con la preservación del ambiente, sino también en transmitir y educar a la gente en general, en que se pueden explotar los recursos, pero deben de ser de una manera razonable y llegar al concepto de un, una explotación sostenible. Entonces, los geoparques permiten eh, el desarrollo de ese, de ese concepto geoético. Y el segundo comentario es que… Eh, los, eh, los geoparques, en particular el que mencionabas de Kiwino, eh, permiten eh, de transmitir el conocimiento o mostrar rasgos geológicos que son unos tangibles y otros intangibles. Por ejemplo, los tangibles, eh, en el caso de Kiwino, hay muchos drumlins y rasgos de carácter glacial, no solamente los volcánicos pero por el otro lado hay otros que, que son solamente efímeros y temporales, pero que recurren cada año, como son por ejemplo los volcanes de hielo, que se dan precisamente en el lago y esa es una cuestión también a explotar, o en el mismo caso de Kiwino, la cantidad de, de récord de depósito de nieve, que es también parte de, este, de, de estos eh, conceptos geológicos, porque al final de cuentas todo eh, redunda en el cuidado de la, del ambiente. Um, bueno, sí, los geoparques, los conceptos no son estáticos, es decir, que no son solamente una, una récord de piedras y fósiles y eso, y eso, son procesos geológicos también que son muy importantes para que, que se pueden um, explicar con los geoparques, procesos, geological processes, que son muy importantes, sí. Thanks for the great talk, Tom. Thanks. And yeah, I wonder if you, as advisory group, are you currently working with a graduate programs in, in I mean, fostering geological programs regarding geoheritage in the U.S. schools? 
because that is important towards developing geoparks. And, bec and also because in here in Mexico, it is, you know, the geoparks are just starting. And among senior, uh, so many senior geologists and universities look at geoheritage as not real geology. And that is a real problem. Yeah. Okay. First of all, that's an excellent question. And at the end of my earlier talk, I recommended to the audience, to Hugo, for example, in the United States, we have no classes in geoconservation or geologic heritage. There's no place for a young student to go to learn about the basic concepts of geoconservation or geologic heritage. <clears throat> and I've been trying to encourage my uh, university friends in the United States to take this subject seriously. Now, some of you know Bill Rose. Bill Rose is a good friend of many of us here. And, and Bill uh, is now a very senior. He's retired, and, he's, and he started a geoheritage program at Michigan Tech, but there's no longer any program. And so your first question, um, the advisory group is trying to encourage universities to take seriously geologic conservation and geoheritage as a, as a curriculum where they could offer a graduate degree like a master's or a PhD. But there is none in the United States, and so I recommend it to Hugo and to others that here in Mexico, you guys, you guys have some wonderful heritage programs on the cultural side, on the archaeological side. And you could easily have a component of that training be geoconservation. So I, I think absolutely, you're absolutely right. Second question, which is also very good. You know, a lot of my friends, when I, when I, in 1989, when the big eruption happened in Alaska, and all the aviation um, impacts occurred, we almost lost a 747 jetliner. It almost crashed because of the ash. And so from 1989 to 1995, all I did with my career was work on the question of volcanic ash and aviation safety. In fact, I came here to Mexico City. I gave lectures at Santa Pred and at the Benito Juarez Airport, and this was part of the international response to volcanic ash and aviation safety. And I remember my very good colleagues in the USGS saying, Tom, why are you wasting your time on worrying about volcanic ash and aviation safety? It's such a rare thing. Why, don't, don't waste your career is going to get off track. Well, now, when you talk about volcanic hazards, probably the number one volcanic hazard away from the volcano is volcanic ash and aviation safety. So I'm not saying I'm a prophet or anything, but I think it's important, if it's of interest to you, to follow up this aspect of, of geoheritage in this case. Um, don't worry about what your friends are saying. Even, even still, I go to IAPSE meetings, and I, I listen, and I hear a lot about the petrology or the geophysics of an eruptive process or volcanic hazards and their impacts. And these are all very, very important. But there's, also, there's almost no discussion at all of the importance of protecting volcanic landscapes. And we had an example, someone asked the question earlier, Sergio, you asked the question about mining in volcanic areas. And in my previous talk, I talked about the threats and challenges. There's a lot of mining that goes on in volcanic areas. And it's, in a way, it's destroying, it's removing that part of the geologic record. We, we can't go out and see it anymore because it's been mined or it's been developed, people have built houses on top, et cetera. And so I think it's, it's very important, if it's, if it's important to you as young people to become involved in geologic heritage here in Mexico, I, I'm convinced that in, in 10 years we won't even have this discussion because geoheritage will become an important component of earth science studies here in Mexico, just like I think it will in the United States, just like it is already in Spain, in Portugal, in England, in China, in Japan. 
They have extensive graduate programs in geoconservation in these countries. We're just, at least in the United States, we're a little bit slower in recognizing that importance and that development. So I would say to the young people in the audience, the early career scientists, don't give up what you're doing in geophysics or geology or geography, but add to that the ideas about geoconservation. Become aware of how your advice can help community, um, the, the, po the political community or the economic community in your country to understand why it's important to protect certain aspects of your landscape or of your, of your, um, your area. So, yeah, those are good questions. And as you can tell, I'm very, I'm very uh, passionate about this because I think geoconservation is a new frontier. I think in the volcano sciences, I think we can do a lot to promote this. Within IAVSE now, and you have the Director General of IAVSE sitting right there. Secretary General? Well, part of a, but it's, Hugo is very important in IFSA. And we have a new commission now called the Commission on Protected Volcanic Landscapes. And so we're trying to explain why these are such important concepts to build into our thinking about how volcanoes work. Yeah. At least that's my, <laughs> that's my soapbox. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, w I wanted to ask you about the financing. I want to, yeah. Um, en los parques, en los parques nacionales, hay un problema fuerte en el financiamiento, sobre todo, por ejemplo, en México y también, por ejemplo, en Italia, en el, en el parque este del Vesubio. O sea, tienen problemas muy graves para financiarse y veo que tienen ustedes eh, 36 billones de, de dólares de extra para, para esto. Entonces, ¿de dónde viene? ¿De hoteles y cosas así que entran o qué? personas visitan los parques nacionales en Estados Unidos, esos son que ellos gastan. Pero ellos ga esas gasolineras y esos hoteles y eso están fuera del parque, ¿no? En Estados Unidos sí, están fuera del parque. Entonces es como un gasto indirecto, pero ¿cómo les llega eso al parque para financiarlo? Pero el razón de tener esos gastos Parques son magnets, mag son muy magnéticos. En Alrededor, el este, generar esta riqueza. Pero en sí, por ejemplo, en Estados Unidos, ¿cómo, cómo se mantiene el parque directamente? Pagan los ciudadanos como yo. Si el gobierno les da. Cuando ustedes visitan Estados Unidos, pagando impuestos en la comida, en, en ah, sí. no sé qué, en varias. Pero no, es que son motores de economía. The national parks are motors for the economy. Y estoy seguro que está igual aquí porque yo me voy a Pachuca Hidalgo. Vamos a Mineral el Chico. Y yo voy a gastar dinero ahí. No sé, no tanto, ¿eh? porque no soy muy rico. Pero yo voy a gastar dinero cuando estoy en Hidalgo. Cuando me voy a morir, yo también. Oh, también me voy a gastar dinero. Así que esos, esos beneficios de los gastos de los visitantes. Promocionas la, el, el desarrollo del área circundante. Sí, sí. Pero tiene un beneficio al, al, a los pueblos alrededor. Al, a la economía de México, los visitantes, no sé, pero yo creo que ustedes después de, después de bueno, ¿qué son? Uh, la industria, autom automóvil industry, um, gasolina, de, uh, petróleo, yo creo que en México eh, turismo es el tercer uh, motor de, de gastos eh, o de, de la economía, ya. Yeah. Pero los presupuestos para los parques son muy bajos. Bueno, usted tiene, uh, sí, 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 Analian, tienes razón. Eh, 
es que los impuestos, los, los, los inversiones del nivel federal para mantener los parques y monumentos del sistema nacional no, no, no cobran todas las los, los necesidades. Y cada año tenemos varios billones de dólares, se llama backlog of maintenance, es el mantenimiento de los parques, lo, 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 los, los edificios, los servicios higiénicos, los, todo eso no cobran, no, they do not cover the needed expenses. Yeah. And it's, bueno, es la vida. We, well, yeah, it's, 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 es un problema, sí, seguramente. Yeah. Bueno, creo que también es eh, muy importante lo que menciona Tom, en Estados Unidos no hay geoparques, por varias razones. ¿no? <coughs> Sin embargo, sí existe una iniciativa y sí puede haber geoparques nacionales como hay en otros países, en Canadá, en China. Alguien me ha dicho que hay 300 geoparques en China, tal vez más, no, no todos son UNESCO, ¿no? sino tiene una tragedia también. Pero, pero eh, lo comento esto porque en Canadá, cuando se formó la red latinoamericana de geoparques, que preside Carles justamente, eh, los canadienses se quedaron viendo y decían, estamos solos. ¿no? La red latinoamericana es de México, digamos, hacia abajo, es más una división cultural que geográfica. Eh, pero Canadá está muy interesada en que se forme una red norteamericana, ¿no? Y me parece que esta, la creo que se está analizando eso incluso, ustedes tienen esta relación con los geoparques canadienses, de poder hacer una especie de red norteamericana de geoparques, que incluye geoparques UNESCO y geoparques que existen y que cumplen seguramente con todos los, los requisitos. ¿no? En esto han estado trabajando también sí, sí, sí. ustedes. Sí. Sí. Entonces, bueno, pues es otra, otra posibilidad de, de establecer este, relación hacia el norte y no nada más hacia el sur. ¿no? Eh, ¿Quieres comentar algo más? Bueno, pues eh, muchísimas gracias Tom por la presentación, sí. creo que cosas muy gracias. interesantes. Gracias. Esperamos que él va a visitar ahora el, el Geoparque de la Comarca en unos días, ojalá pueda regresar a visitar el, el Geoparque más por importante sí. que tiene México. <risa> El otro geoparque también, este, pero te va, seguramente te gustaría porque es, es un paisaje también muy degradado, muy erosionado, que deja al descubierto una maravilla de, de paisaje, del cual también se puede aprender, ¿no? Se aprenden cosas buenas y las cosas malas, entonces, y las cosas finalmente, se, todo lo que se aprende es bueno. Pues muchas gracias, muchas gracias a todos ustedes, les, les mandaremos... Información para la siguiente sesión que va a ser la próxima semana, ¿verdad? También un poco fuera de los horarios habituales, pero vamos a tener aquí a la, a las, a la una, a la una, un poquito antes, ya saben que citamos como en bodas, un poquito, unos minutos antes, pero a la una empezaríamos y es una plática que viene a darnos eh, Carlos Lascano, eh, conocido de muchos de nosotros, eh, un especialista en Karst y que nos viene a hablar de la Sierra Gorda en Querétaro. Entonces, si gustan, aquí los esperamos. Gracias.